Kevin Miller. Uh -huh. Kevin, you, you you spoke about a very very interesting subject. So, it, the 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 big markets, big sort of pathology markets, get most of the attention and and conversation. We you, know, you talk about lenses and MIGs and all that stuff, and and rightfully so. Uh, you uh, are giving the uh, Charles Cummins lecture on a sort of an underserved population, a population with a, a problem um, for which there has been no a surgical FDA approved treatment. Uh, so let, let me get you to sort of spell this out. Give me the uh, lay of the, of the land. Here. Yeah, well this is correct. Um, we're talking about patients who have iris defects. Um, and for years we've been able to fix small iris defects with sutures and, and that's quite effective. You know, iridotomies, um, traumatic medriasis, uh, things like that, small lacerations that have been you know, caused by screwdrivers and things. But we've never had a good solution for the patient with the large iris defect. Um, our solutions now are wear these tinted glasses or wear this Im impossible to wear artificial pupil contact lens that you know, blocks out some of the light, but then also blocks out your peripheral vision. Um, these patients usually are aphakic, so they're we're talking thick contact lenses. Or do what most of them do, which is just close the eye all the time. So it's a miserable experience, and not only that, um, there's the light and glare and photosensitivity and all those issues and the blurred vision and what the loss of contrast. But there is also a, an emotional impact of these iris defects on patients' lives. Not, not just the iris impact, but the iris defect, but the, the initial trauma, because most of these are traumatic, some of them are congenital, but there's the, there's the injury and then there's the, the, all the comorbidities that come with that, the glaucoma, the failed cornea, all the surgeries. So a lot of emotional pathology that these patients come into your office with. And, and up until recently, we had nothing to offer them other than just keep doing what you're doing, which is wear dark glasses or this, this god-awful um, artificial pupil contact lens. But now we have something to offer. Yeah, talk, talk about that, please. Yeah. So uh, clinical trial ran for multiple years, as most do. Um, FDA um, authorized 580 um, subjects to be enrolled. I think 400 and, I might get this wrong, but 437, I believe, were enrolled. 44 of those were pediatric eyes, and then 403 were um, adult eyes. <clears throat> they went through a one-year follow-up course. Um, there was no randomization, because you can't randomize these people to living as they are. So it's, it's a consecutive series, a surgical series. And you know, looking at the usual outcomes, looking at um, patient-reported um, satisfaction, um, reduction of symptoms, and then um, complications and adverse events. And you know, so suffice it to say, the FDA thought the thing was safe and effective. So as of May 2018, just last year, it was FDA approved, and then it got to the, uh, the the labeling issues by October. So as of October last year, we now have a device that's commercial. It's available. Um, surgeons have to go through a certification process in order to be um, able to order the device and implant it. And they have to have uh, fulfill a, a number of prerequisites to be um, eligible to even go through the certification process. So this will not be um, implanted by, by novice surgeons. This has to be a very experienced surgeon who's been in the eye many, many times and has dealt with complex cases. And what, what does the, the device look, look like? What's it made from? Are, are there avenues for aqueous flow through it? How do, yeah. tell me, tell me so that. this device is silicone. Um, there are other device manufacturers out there. Um, Optec makes a uh, PMMA lens, a PMMA iris and, and iris lens combinations. Um, Morcher does the same. There's this PMMA. And there's a Russian company called Reaper or Reaper NN that makes an acrylic device. So, there, so the, the human optics device, the one we're speaking of, is a silicone I, uh, iris. It's, uh, it has no integrated optic like some of the others do just a silicone device, but it's rollable or foldable. You can inject it through a, a, a larger you know, IOL injector. Um, it comes in two models, a fiber containing and a fiber free model. If you're just gonna passively fixate the device inside the capsule bag or in the sulcus, you can use the, the fiber free model. But if you're gonna suture it to something, you want the fiber containing model because it'll resist uh, you know, the cheese wiring. And the device is custom hand painted uh, uh, basically off of a template photo, usually from the patient's good eye. Most of these are um, traumatic cases, so they have a good eye and they have the traumatized eye. Now, if it's a congenital case, which a few of them are, um, then they can just pick up a stock photo. You know? And we usually encourage, I, I currently now encourage brown, 
because the congenitals all have a bad uh, sensory nystagmus. And if you have a brown eye and you have a nice nystagmus, it's the cosmetic effect of it's not so bad. But if you have a blue or green eye, which I tell you, every single congenital enric wants blue eyes. I don't know why, but that's just the way it's been playing out. And I used to fall into the trap of giving them their blue eyes, but then the, the nystagmus becomes so obvious cosmetically that I now really discourage that. So custom painted, uh, according to the patient's fellow eye, we don't change eye color with this. It's not a cosmetic implant. It's just to, to restore kind of a natural look to that. And, and that it does it's in an incredible way. And, and, and what is the surgical technique like? All over the map. Because it depends on the patient's ocular comorbidities. So um, about a third of the cases that I do involve uh, corneal transplant. Um, another maybe 10% have a failing cornea, but we'll put the thing in, make the cornea fail further, and then we'll do an endothelial keratoplasty after that. Um, a few of them um, will go in at the time of cataract surgery. That's probably the mi minority. Um, a lot of them are sutured in. Um, they have a cornea that's going to probably make it through, so we'll just uh, we'll, we'll suture a lens to the back of the artificial iris, and then nowadays we're suturing the iris to the sclera, usually using Gore-Tex. So we'll suture the iris to the, and the lens together using proline. Um, and then there's no issues with uh, blockage of aqueous uh, from the posterior segment to the anterior segment. In the early days, we would uh, do a, an iridectomy on the artificial iris, thinking we had to preserve some route for, for aqueous um, flow. But there's not been a single case report of, of, of pupillary block, or I'm not even sure what you call it here, but block of flow. And so every, every one of us that started this years ago basically given up doing the, um, the iridotomy or iridectomy. Uh, really, really, really interesting. Um, uh, granted that the sort of clinical setting is, uh, is a fairly broad spectrum for these patients. Yes. There are a lot of different things that patients are coming to the table with. Uh, it's, it's not all that fair for me to ask what adverse events you've, you've um, observed, but I mean, obviously that's an important question. Yeah. So the biggest adverse event um, would be um, corneal decompensation. Most of these eyes are on, are teetering on the edge of decompensation, and we tell them, you know, this is just one more insult to your eye to put this iris and perhaps this lens into your eye. You're going to go from a count of 920 cells per square millimeter probably down to 600, and maybe you'll survive for another year or two. But, you know, the writing's on the wall. Your cornea's going to fail at some point, just a matter of when. And when that happens, no problem. We'll just do an endothelial keratoplasty. Um, about a third of the patients that come in that have had this history have glaucoma already. One of the questions is, does this cause glaucoma? If it does, it's, it's the incremental change is so small to be not an issue. So are these patients you know, on glaucoma drops or do they get tubes? Yeah, a, a lot of them. But we're not seeing a lot of additional glaucoma from this, at least in the short term. I mean, these eyes all had bad injuries, so you know, their long-term outlook of a remaining glaucoma-free is not very good. But, but, but failed corneas are probably the number one thing. Um, in terms of you know long term, but you know, these are the same people that, who are going to fail instead of failing in a year or two, they're going to fail in five or six years because of their injury. Right, and uh, and and as you say, there's no um, ethical or, or or practical way to do a, right. a controlled study. Right. Uh, so yeah, you can uh, imagine randomizing people to keep your eye, your really screwed up, slight sensitive eye, for the next five or six years while we make you a control to somebody who's in a clinical trial. That's, or, you know, on the study arm of a clinical trial. Who's yeah. going to sign up for that trial? Yeah, no, 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 no of course not. Um, to, and, and what is the, the, the device called? It's the Human Optics uh, Custom Flex Artificial Iris. So it was, um, the, it was the concept of a, of, a, of, a, of a German ophthalmologist, Hans Reiner Koch, and uh, he worked through a company called Dr. Schmidt Intraocularensen. That, that company was then licensing the product through Human Optics, which then later acquired it. And now that it's FDA approved in the United States, it's being distributed through a, a local company called Veo or VEO Ophthalmics. And the price is, 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 is a little bit shocking. It's $7,700. That's just for the device. And at this, at this point in time, we don't have, this is a brand new product, we don't have CPT codes, HixPix codes, none of that stuff. So that's being worked on, but patients at this moment are still having to pay that out of pocket. But the, I mean, it, as as you say, it's 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 hand painted. Yeah, you know, to the, to the work patient. effort that goes into this. It, from the time we order the device until we receive it, it's twelve to fourteen weeks. So it's a process. Yeah, really, really, really interesting stuff. Um, I I can see why you're giving the Kelman lecture for for this. Um, Kevin, I want to thank you very much for 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 bringing this this interesting topic, this device, to us. 
um, and, and especially, I, I want to thank you for the generosity of, of your time with us today. Josh, it's great being with you and great being in San Francisco. And I uh, hope some people can come out and watch the lecture.